So if you can start out by just telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in astronomy in the first place, that would be interesting to us, I think. And if, if you have your own telescope, that would be also interesting to us. Okay, so um, so like my name's Denise Stevens. Um, I'll just start from how I got interested in astronomy. So um, my dad um, took an astronomy class at BYU when he was a student many, many years ago um, as an elective, loved it. And um, once he had a little bit of money, he bought himself a telescope. So I was probably about five when he bought a telescope and he got like a 13 inch daub. Um, and uh, he used to direct, so I lived in Southern California in a town called Victorville, which if you've ever driven to Disneyland on I-15, you've driven through it. So um, that's where I grew up and they used to do star parties there in Southern California. And so um, in the mountains there between LA and, and the desert, basically. Um, and so um, I remember going to a few star parties with him and looking through telescopes. They're like, you know, climbing on the ladders. I know some of you guys have those telescopes, but climbing on the ladders to look through them. Um, my dad bought a telescope and that was his hobby. And so um, when I was a kid, I had a subscription to like astronomy for kids. I think astronomy magazine did something like that back then. And then, um, and my dad used to drag me out of bed to look at things. And I did that since I was about 12 or 13, I rebelled. I was knocking out of bed anymore at two in the morning to come see anything um, that he had in his telescope. Um, and then in high school, I discovered physics and I loved physics. And so I started, uh, so I came to be always a physics major and discovered you could take astronomy classes as part of the physics major. And that got me back into astronomy. And I discovered that I liked astronomy a lot better than like mechanics or optics because it was real. It felt more real. And so that's how I started doing research in astronomy. Um, my husband, Tom's back there. I met him. He was also a major and um, we're both astronomers. So we uh, got our bachelor's in physics. Went to New Mexico State and got our master's and our PhDs in astronomy. Um, and then um, while doing my PhD work, that's when I discovered um, the first brown dwarf was discovered. The first exoplanet was discovered in 1995. I started my PhD in 90s, or my master's, my graduate school in 96. And so uh, that's how I started getting involved in exoplanet and brown dwarf research. And um, from that very beginning, more, more, more brown dwarfs, there were not really a lot of exoplanets you could study yet. It's still in the discovery phase. Um, started doing brown dwarf research and um, got my PhD in 2002. And then I went to Johns Hopkins, no, the Space Telescope Science Institute for three years on a postdoc. And then Johns Hopkins for three years on a postdoc. And then came to BYU in 2007 and took a faculty position here at BYU. Would it be easy for you guys to hear me without the mask? Yeah. Is that better? All right. I will try not to breathe on everyone. <laughs> so, all right. Is it sharing screen OK? Okay, uh, do you have any questions for me? And it's kind of my background. So my dad was an enthusiastic amateur astronomer. And I still love astronomy, right? It wasn't that I rebelled as much as 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock fine, but two in the morning, there was no way anymore. <laughs> he, he had that kind of a passion and, and I had school the next morning. Um, so uh, let me go ahead and, um, so I, I put together a presentation on James Webb and I realized I put it together Last time I gave this talk was before James Webb launched, so I had to add a few more things really quickly because now we are launched. Um, and I think kind of understanding why we're doing what we're doing. Um, NASA has really two big questions, right? There are two questions that kind of drive almost every NASA mission. How do we get here and are we alone? And so right now, kind of the two extremes of cosmology and the early universe and the structure of the early universe and how the universe came into being and the first stars and galaxies are driving one end of the spectrum. And then of course exoplanets are kind of driving the other end of the spectrum, trying to find planets around other stars that could have life on them. And then of course all the science in between benefits as you develop a telescope capable of answering some of those big questions or at least addressing them better than we ever have in the past. So I stole this um, from a uh, Dr. Ule, I'm going to say that wrong because it's, it's French. I'm not very good at French. But anyway, it's a really kind of cool little demo showing you kind of how we came from this whole idea of building a new telescope answer, new questions, and new questions. So thousands of years ago, this was astronomy, right? And it's the part we love the most, I think. Went out to a dark sky site, seeing the stars, seeing the Milky Way, and start asking those questions of where did we come from? Why are we here? What's out there? Um, and then, of course, Long come total. So um, the Hubble Space Telescope comes along. And what was so important about Hubble 
um, I think probably one of the big things that Hubble did for us is it started allowing us to observe and high detail star formation regions. So I remember in 1994 being an undergraduate, having a talk in the BYU and started talking about, he was talking about protoplanetary disks. And Hubble had imaged the first protoplanetary disks around stars in the Orion Nebula. And that was a huge deal. We already all, we always had a theory that we, the disk would form around the star, you'd have planets forming that disk. But until Hubble actually imaged those disks and we could see them in person, um, it's just a theory until you've actually observed that it's actually the real fact. So Hubble did a lot for us with his observations of star forming regions, um, like the Orion Nebula and the formation of, um, of planets around stars. And then, of course, um, flows of creation in the star forming region, but then merging galaxies. Um, and the importance of merging galaxies is the building up galaxies from smaller to larger sizes. Still doing okay? Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm oh, trying to turn the other camera off. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, thinking about merging galaxies and the galaxy structure, the Hubble Deep Field was really instrumental in helping us understand, kind of for the first time, a little bit of the variety of galaxies that were out there, the number of galaxies that were out there, and then of course we started adding the red shifts to produce movies like this with distances. Um, hopefully the other movies play better than this is playing. Um, they have words. So. Um, but this is just kind of showing you as we're spreading out through time um, and different galaxies. And one thing you notice in the Hubble Deep Field is the galaxies that are nearby. Um, we see some spiral structures and elliptical galaxies. You go farther back in time and much, many more mergers. And you go really far back in time, you begin to see kind of these smaller, um, abnormally shaped galaxies. So we start building theories then of galaxy structure and how small galaxies combine and merge to create larger galaxies that we see today. Um, and so Hubble really paved the way for the construction of the James Webb Space Telescope. So here's a picture of James Webb. And um, of course, this is not just a NASA mission. Um, there are several other the Canadians, Europeans, et cetera, are all involved in this mission to send this telescope into space. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and play this movie. Um, it's before the launch, but I think in 10 minutes, they do a better job of explaining everything that's happening did happen and is continuing to happen right now um, than I could. So let's hope this plays OK. This is the science mission on par with Apollo missions, Space Shuttle, International Space Station, and Hubble missions. For nearly two decades, thousands of people around the world, many have spent their entire careers, built the James Webb Space Telescope. And it all comes down to this. Once we launch the James Webb Space Telescope, there are no second chances. We have 300 single point failure items, and they all have to work right. When you're a million miles away from the Earth, you can't send someone to fix it. We've never put a telescope this large in space. We want to see distant parts of the universe humans have never seen before. Looking back in time, almost 14 billion years to see the first galaxies that formed after the Big Bang. And we want to search for the building blocks of life in the atmospheres of planets orbiting distant stars. To unfold the history of the universe, we must first unfold this telescope. is the largest primary mirror, the largest sun shield, and the most powerful space telescope ever built. And yet, this large telescope needs to fit inside a 5.4 meter diameter rocket fairing. That just is available rocket, and it brings right to space. size limit, we build web to fold like origami to fit inside it. This brings us to our most challenging part of this mission, unfolding it in space. Thank God. Think of what you're doing. Extraordinarily delicate, precise, state-of-the-art scientific instrument. You're slapping
us in outer space has to live through this environment and work once it gets there with That's how long it would take to fully deploy the Webb telescope. We can take longer if we need to, but after launch are going to be nail biters. This is the Mission Operations Center at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. Those two weeks after launch will be like our Super Bowl. Uh, you pick years of training comes down to these moments. The Webb Observatory has 50 major deployments. 50 categorize them, and 178 release mechanisms must work to deploy those 50. One of them. Unfolding web is hands down the most complicated spacecraft activity we've ever done. Then again, nothing about web is easy. We've never done any of this before. There's nothing simple about sending anything into space. You can't do it without taking risks. This mission is squarely in new spacecraft territory. Webb is the perfect example of science desire driving engineering capability to new frontiers. Webb's unique design was born from reasoned engineering to accomplish its science goals. Here's the plan. Shortly after launch, we unfold Webb's solar panel for power and our Huygen antenna for communication. About 12 hours later, we have an important engine firing that sends Webb on the proper course towards its orbital destination, about a million miles away. That's where Webb will do its science. Webb will be moving so fast, it passes the moon's orbit in one and a half days, half the time it took Apollo astronauts to reach lunar orbit. First, we lower the sun shield out. Then raise Webb's primary mirror and instruments away from the sun shield. The solar wind will push us around with the sunshine open, so we'll unfold a trim tab to help keep us stable. We got these huge, iconic, golden segmented mirrors that will help us deliver amazing new images from the cosmos. But in some ways, the sun shield is a lot more complicated, and it's just as essential. Without it, nothing works. Here we've got five sun shield layers, of approximately 8,900 square feet, almost the size of three tennis courts, a very thin Kapton material about one to two thousandths of an inch thick. Making them go where you want them to go in zero G is extremely challenging. The sun chill shades the telescope from the heat of the sun, earth, and moon. The concept is simple, but there is nothing simple about the design or operation, especially when you get to space. Webb's sun shield assembly includes 140 release mechanisms, approximately 70 hinge assemblies, eight deployment motors, bearings, springs, gears, about 400 pulleys, and 90 cables totaling 1,312 feet. All this just to keep the sun shield under control as it unfolds. First, we release these special restraints that protect the sun shield during launch. They roll out of the way, but not all the way until we are ready to deploy a side. Next, we release a set of covers over the core region. Now comes the critical point. All 107 sun shield release mechanisms need to fire on cue. 107. They free the five sun shield layers, allowing them to extend as the mid booms deploy. Until fully deployed, we start setting up the optics. First, the secondary mirror is extended and locked into place. And a special radiator behind Webb is extended, which helps further lower the temperature of the science instruments. Finally, we open the primary mirror's wings and lock them in place. With that done, Webb is in its final configuration, but we're not done yet. After 47 deployments, and accomplishing the hardest spacecraft unfolding NASA has ever done, Webb still won't be ready for science. While the instruments cool, will control motors behind each of Webb's 18 mirror segments, the secondary mirror, 
and the fine steering mirror located inside the center of the primary mirror. We'll precisely align the mirror segments to form a perfect mirror. Then, Webb will be ready to explore the cosmos. like is I could sit here and tell you about that stuff, but listening to them talk about everything that has to fire and everything that has to happen, um, it was really kind of nail biting. I actually did not watch the launch because I was kind of terrified that I'm a bad luck charm <laughs> and it would explode. <laughs> so, um, and then um, the stage we're at right now is that that kind of final stage where it's unfolded, the secondary is in place, and now it's cooling. And as it cools, They'll begin alignment of the mirrors, but you have to get the telescope to cool down um, to, I guess, ambient temperature for space, right? We've got to get down to that temperature um, so that the optics will all align properly. And that's the stage we're in right now. And that's gonna take several months. Um, and then we'll start taking calibration images. And then this summer, we should start getting our first science images down from James Webb. You guys have yeah, questions anytime here, yeah. Yeah, uh, if you could take just a moment out and explain how an object out in space can orbit around nothing in one fixed place. In other words, explain sure. the Lagrange point. Yeah, that's actually the next slide. I'm glad you asked that. I guess I was you were you were on top of it. <laughs> Lagrange point. So what the Lagrange point is is um, we often talk about force of gravity, right? And it's about two objects. Well, we've actually got three objects here. We have the sun. We have the Earth. And then we have the space telescope. A Lagrange point here at L2, the combined force of the Sun and Earth is such that the acceleration of the object in orbit right here will be the same acceleration as the Earth's orbit here um, at 180 from the Sun. So as the Earth orbits around the Sun, this gauge of space telescope has the exact same orbital period. And so it will always stay basically in Earth's shadow with the Earth between it and the Sun. So you're adding that third body, you have the Sun and you have the Earth. So that combined force on it puts its acceleration period the same period as the Earth's orbital period around the sun. Is that? That's how L2 that works. Yeah. So it's in the Earth's shadow and that's well, how it cools down? No, 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 no. Oh, it's not. It's a million miles from the Earth. The moon just spreads its Earth's shadow half the time. So yeah, it's it's a million miles from the Earth. So it's not really in your shadow. I just, but I guess what I kind of meant was it will never point back at the sun. So with James Webb, the instruments, you have to keep the temperature so cold on the far side of the sun shield. And I'll show you a little bit here that James Webb's motion has to be kind of, so if I'm the Earth, right, it's always pointed this direction, that direction. It will never look at like Venus or the moon or Mercury, maybe Mars, maybe, but really the inner solar system's off limits because it gets you too close to the sun. So normally the spacecraft would want to lag behind the Earth because it's in a farther out orbit, so it should be moving slower. But the Earth is kind of pulling it along with it then? Yeah, basically. It's on a grav gravitational tether. Yeah, yeah so it's yeah. not really orbiting around nothing. It's being pulled along, and then it kind of oscillates a little bit. Yeah, it pulls along, we oscillate. Um, let me show you the movie, because it's kind of cold watch it oscillate. Let me start the movie going. Um, Does it have sound? No, not words. So we're, all, we're fine. Yeah, it's going to have this kind of oscillation to all it is right now. So there's a distance of a million miles away, and then there's the orbit around the L2 um, as it goes around. Just Either, but that's what its motion is looking like. So, just to clarify, because it's still a little confusing, how it's orbiting something that doesn't exist. Right? Oh, it's orbiting the sun and the earth. Okay, well, that's spinning part. You think of two objects that are gravitationally bound, right? Mm -hmm. You're saying the L2 point is, is itself a. It's orbiting the sun. A point that has a gravitational attraction. Yeah, so, so you've got the pull of both the combined mass of the sun and the earth. In that, that pole right there. And that's, that allows it to make it a little. Not the circle, no. That just keeps it, that, that gives it the same orbital period as the Earth has. Um, 
know. Go, Joe, you want to help? It's still, it's still <laughs> not clear in my head. It, yeah, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. It's just that the Earth is pulling it around with it in its orbit. It's not entirely, it's not stable, and so... Yeah, so it's going to have this oscillating. Uh, so the oscillation is necessarily intentional. It's just, it's just a given what happens when... Well, it no, it's intentional. intentional in the sense that that oscillation keeps it more stable. It keeps, that point it, it keeps it more stable and allows us better ability to point and control it as we have to point that. I mean, the, the, big, the only big problem with James Webb is you have to swing it from huge parts of the sky because we're looking at objects swinging towards the entire sky. And so it's constantly swinging, picking up momentum that you then have to lose and things like that. And so given it that, given it that kind of circular orbit around that L2 point, um, giving it that velocity is like Joe says, helping to keep it stable. Yeah. I What's the diameter of that L2 circle? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. We're talking about hundreds of miles or something? Probably, yeah. That's a good question. We'll have to Google that. I don't know. If someone wants to Google it, they can Google it for me. Yeah. Let's ask the heat shield that keeps the whole telescope cold or at ambient temperature. Is that so that it doesn't flex the things? They'll stay. Yeah, we don't want that. We don't want that happening. And then we have infrared cameras, and so to operate in the infrared, we need the temperatures to be incredibly cold. So, I'm um, let me just jump ahead here to a slide. Um, can I skip out? Um, I was going to explain infrared here, but let's just jump to it. Um, so this is the wavelength range of some of the different telescopes that we've launched in the past into space. So Hubble was not an infrared telescope. It was basically an optical telescope. Um, this is the electromagnetic spectrum of light. So you've got visible light over here. We've got some ultraviolet over here. Um, and then from about red here visible on, we hit into the infrared. So one micron is a, a thousand nanometers. Um, visible light, red light takes off about 750 nanometers. That's about where your eyes are no longer sensitive. And so as we go beyond 750 nanometers to 0.75 microns out, um, we're now entering the infrared. How these detectors work in the infrared is they have a uh, they have a, a substrate. They are made of some are made of like we call it mercury uh, cadmium telluride. I can't even think that's coming to mind right now. So never mind what mercury is, but anyways, mercury HD. HD thank you. I'm like I need I need something. So we have substrates like this. We have substrates made of silicon arsenide, and in these materials. Um, they're kind of like semiconductors, kind of like they've got these electrons trapped in them. Um, and these electrons are in a certain energy level. And then there's a small gap. And how these detectors work is through the photoelectric effect. A photon comes in, and then that photon has just the right amount of energy. This electron will absorb that energy, jump the gap, and then we'll go into this upper layer right here, where we can then trap it. Um, in like a capacitor or something, we can hold the charge there. And then this is how the detector, we count the electrons that are released by the photons and that corresponds to how bright the object is. The more electrons get released, the more light that came in. Optical telescopes use silicon and silicon has a really, really big band gap. And so only photons that are higher energy in the blue to red part of the spectrum can have enough energy um, that when they're absorbed, the electrons can make the jump. Infrared photons have much, much lower energy than optical photons do. So you need a detector that has a much smaller, we call band gap, so that when these low energy photons come in, the electron can then make the jump up. The problem is you have thermal energy as well. If it's hot, the electrons are moving, they have motion, and if it's too hot, this electron can easily jump that band gap without any issues at all. And so it'll just jump. And so you get what we call dark current. You have all these electrons kind of jumping up and flooding up. So we have to keep the telescope as cold as possible um, so that that doesn't happen. So we don't have all this noise from the detector that's just due to being hot versus um, an actual detection from photons. And we're looking at photons from James Webb's operating from about one point, I guess 0.7 microns here, up to about 28 microns. In the infrared. And so, in order to detect those, um, and most of the cameras are actually just one to five microns, which is easier to do. But MIRI goes out to 20, 26, 28 microns. I'm trying to figure out how to turn the camera off, sorry. Oh, it's okay. 
think now it's good. And send him. OK, so. So one micron. OK, so I can put. Um, one times 10 to the 8th microns. Into one centimeter. So that's how small a micron is. And then, then the energy of a photon corresponds to its wavelength. So the energy of the photon is equal to Planck's constant, which is just this H. Don't worry about that. Speed of light divided by the wavelength. So as you go to longer and longer wavelengths, the energy of photons get shorter and shorter and shorter. And so you've got to have those detectors cold so that you can you can measure that infrared light that's coming off of the telescope. And we don't mess ourselves up. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah. Is the resolution of those infrared sensors comparable to visible light? Yes. I have a slide for that too. Okay, let's jump to it. Sorry, I'm probably going to mess you up really bad, Joe. <laughs> okay, so here are the instruments, first of all, just so you can see them. And I'll go back to the slide. This is where they're on the infrared. So we've got uh, three detectors that operate from one to five microns, and then Mary Roberts from five to 30 microns. And the big difference is the material the detector is made out of. In order to see really low energy photons, Mary is built out of a different array material than the other three are. Um, but these are cameras that can take imaging and spectroscopy, um, and Mary does both as well. So let me show you the resolution and how that compares to Hubble, because that's probably the best one to, take a, take, to compare against. Um, so resolution, right? And I think you're probably better resolution than maybe a lot of professional astronomers are, right? Because you, you, know, you want to see, you know, close binary system or binary star, but you want to be able to resolve bands on Saturn, you know, Saturn's range, right? And look at bands on Jupiter. Um, and so the resolution. Um, so I've got three telescopes for comparison. You normally use um, Hubble, obviously. Spitzer. Um, also paid the way for James Webb. It was our only telescope capable of gaining what we call mid-infrared spectra, spectra from 5 to 15 to 40 microns. Um, and so it's been dead for a while, but when it operated, um, its different cameras um, had different resolutions. And it's kind of hard to see the lines going on. Um, let's just compare ACS around Hubble. So ACS operates at um, 5 up. Well, this is ACS's resolution at yellow light. Yellow green line about 500 nanometers, and it's 0.043 arc seconds. And I don't, I mean, ACS is now dead, but I don't think we've ever had resolution better than that, than that on the Hubble. Like, neither Hubble cameras are that good. Um, and so, basically, do you guys know what an arc second is? Yes. Yeah. 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 All right. So, I'm going to work that. My students know that. <laughs> okay. So, uh, about 0.043, and that's the best we have in a space telescope. As far as I know, James Webb will be almost as good. Your camera at two microns will have a resolution of 0.063 arc seconds. Um, and so, for as far as the, the high resolution stuff goes, um, NERCAL will do a lot of that, that work at um, two microns for those projects that be higher resolution. Um, as you go to longer wavelengths, um, the resolution is going to drop because as you go to longer wavelengths, um, the, the diffraction of light becomes greater and greater. Right? The area just gets larger and larger. It starts. The point of function starts out. So as you go into um, four microns, um, and on your channel, it's going to be 0.126 arc seconds. You need double the wavelength. And then Mary, which is operating at 10 and 20, will get 0.3 and 0.6. But when you compare that to what Spencer could do for resolution, which is 24 microns is 6.18 arc seconds, this is far exceeding. You know, So that, that's kind of exciting. Um, yeah, really cool resolution images of objects. Um, I'm interested in binary systems too, so being able to resolve both components of the binary system is a huge game of Hubble. I'm sorry, games with I used Hubble to do that in the past, but I think it's going to help us out there. Other questions? Yeah, other questions? All right, let, let's look at some more things that make James Webb interesting. Um, I mean, it is interesting, but um, let's see if that'll start back up. So, as you know, it find oh, and my date is wrong. Okay, like I said, I gave this talk. Yeah. <laughs> years back. <laughs> see, years right. It was Christmas Day, right? Yeah. Yes. So, 
yeah like i said i i also have seven kids so i was kind of busy that day but my husband watched it i didn't it looked like i was sleeping and i up all night so anyways um so there's the lagrange point um i want this video to play again and i'm just gonna just no, ignore the sound i'm gonna see if i can why not to do okay it's because mm -hmm. the speaker and the microphone are feeding back on each other so if we mute temporarily then it'll sound oh. fine Is the slide I want. So the hot side, the cold side, and let me if I click up here. Um, get rid of that. This is what this is why the sun shield is so important. On the hot side of the sun shield, um, it's a little hard to see. 185 degrees Fahrenheit. On the other side of the sun shield, I'm sorry, it's so hard to see. Everything drops down to about um, let's use Celsius. 85 degrees Celsius on the hot side, negative 233 degrees Celsius on the cold side. That's why the sun shield is so important. At those temperatures, they can keep these. I mean, and that was a big thing with James Webb. The thing with Spitzer, when it launched, was it used coolant. It used this. Um, this is all electronic um, heating or cooling things taking place. Um, with Spitzer, they had a coolant that they put the instruments in of liquid helium, which then cooled them down to a low enough temperature that the detectors could then work. We don't have that problem here. We're using the sun shield to keep everything extremely cold on the night side. All right, let me start this again. And the electronics to pull that heat out. Um, so, oh, big advantage to James Webb compared to Hubble, which is just kind of flashed by there. Hubble, you can only take data for about 45 minutes. Then you're on the, then the sun, there's in the way. So your orbit's 90 minutes. You get 45 minutes of data on Hubble, Nothing for 45 minutes. Another 45 minutes call these orbits. Nothing. Um, and so there's a few what we call continuous viewing zones, like we get these for the Hubble deep fields, where you can stare for a long period of time. But most science observations were limited to 45 minutes, and you had to stop, and then come back on the target 45 minutes, and then stop. And so Hubble would literally sit there and plan. Observe this object over here in the sky. Do this one's proposal. Do this proposal. Do this proposal. And they would literally just put pieces of proposals in. And your orbits came when they came and you would get notification about three weeks in advance that you're going to be able to serve. And then that was the end of it. So that's when you could find out. Um, yeah, Joe. So a question from online. Were the, uh, the L4 and L5 uh, Lagrange points considered for their kids' mm -hmm. webinar? It's not why not, do you know? I don't know why not. I know there's a bunch of dust there. Um, it's, yeah, it, it's the same thing as the Trojans were on Jupiter. So it's that same kind of situation. And I know there's questions of dust there, um, probably because this, the um, I would guess it's probably easier at the sun shield at the L2 point, but yeah, because the sun shield or L2 blocks the Earth and the sun. Yes. The Whereas if you're those other points, you can't do both. Yeah. So and that's and the Earth is extremely warm, right? The Earth is emitting light. It peaks at 10 microns. So at 300 Kelvin, um, there's this nice little cool rule that I, I use. You know. You take 2898 divided by the temperature, and that gives you the wavelength in microns where the optics peaking. For 300 Kelvin Earth, the Earth peaks at 10 microns, which is where Miri's operating. And that's, I mean, and in near camp. So on Earth, so Joe knows this from observing, as we get to about two, two and a half microns, the background sky does this, and it's a huge source of noise. Um, it really limits us from doing a lot of things on the ground, even if the, if the sky is transparent that wavelengths. The background becomes a real problem to deal with on the Earth. So yeah. Thank you, Tom. It's kind of like trying to observe in the middle of the daytime yes. all the time. All the time. <laughs> the, my students, I always get in this day, like, what's this a picture of? And it's Saturn, right? But you have to subtract the sky out, which is like 40,000 counts to see like the 10,000 counts of Saturn hidden in there or something, or 5,000. It's ridiculously small. 
Um, so what's the problem? I don't know what's playing down there. Um, I think I started again. Um, but I think that kind of hit what I wanted to. The sun shield. Um, oh, and I did want to show you the tip and the tilt here. Um, so the way this is going to work is it's always taking images then they're away from the Earth. Um, so you've got what we call the field of regard. And so you can see it kind of tips from five to 45 degrees in this direction and tips back and forth um, five degrees in that direction. And then this map is showing you how it can trace out the sky over time. So when you put in targets for James Webb or you're making a proposal, um, you literally, it spits back at you the times that you can observe. And it's these six weeks or these months from where your target is located. And it literally for like the next several years says, you can observe it this time, this time, this time, this time, this time, this time. If you want to do like a transiting planet that has to happen at a certain time, right? Then you have to make sure the transit occurs at a time when James Webb can actually point at that area of the sky. And so that's James Webb's limitations compared to Hubble. You have the, you have bigger windows of time that you can observe, and you can stare at something for you know 10,000 um, seconds, no issues. Just sit there and stare at it. Um, but if I want something that, that that's like a transiting planet, that's kind of time sensitive, or if we're going after like a simpler going after a supernova explosion just happened, it may not be in that Google zone at that time. So there is some tiny constraints on on time sensitive data. So from where it is at that particular time, so when it's up here, when it's down here, like so you have that six months going on, and so it just comes on this point down. So if the Earth's here, it's kind of a big point down. When the Earth's here, it's kind of more up. Always keeping the Earth between the sun shield and the point. If you have 360 orbit, they can only go above and below the point of the orbit five degrees. We, well, we need the whole sky eventually, yeah. So as it goes around, we get the whole sky eventually. Yeah, we do the whole side eventually. It's, it's kind of, I mean, you can kind of see it. It's a really, I should have made the video bigger. You can kind of see it as it's sweeping out there. But that's kind of showing you that slowly over time, you start getting the whole sky edge. That, that, that blue thing is showing you this coverage of the sky. Um, and then, um, like we said, it's got four cameras on it. It's got Miri, which is over there on the right. It's the Miri, the, the min infrared camera. Um, and then near cam, near spec, and it's lost there, but FGS right here. Um, I think and nearest, which I'm not seeing nearest easy. I'll find it in a minute anyways, but it has those different cameras on it. Um, let's talk about just, um, well, answer more questions too, but I think it's fun. The total cost was $10 billion on this mission. Yeah, go ahead. So that orbit, that turbo is going to more ground point. That's part of what lets us see the whole sky run. Yes. If there were a fixed point, then you would only have five degrees yes. above and below the sky. And you said six months, that awesome quick. Okay. Now these maps make more sense. I've seen. I'm like, why, why do I see this get more and kind of why do I think it's going to get less? And it depends on my target is in the sky. Right. You can actually rotate with the yeah. shield back against the sun. So it actually has a 360 rotation there, and then it has five degrees taken move yeah. in that 360. Yeah. Right. 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 So it's on the sun now, and then as it goes, it sticks up the whole sky. Okay. Right. Any other questions? But that has real impact. If you want to monitor the brightness of a variable star or planets orbiting or whatever, and you're limited to a two week window every six months, that's a big limitation for those kinds of temporal monitoring programs. It is. So when I, I was back at Space Telescope before COVID, when we thought we'd launch a lot earlier, and um, while I was there, we were going through some of the solar system objects and their time constraints, and then, of course, exoplanets. And some exoplanets really have really tight time constraints. And so NASA will do so much exoplanets, but it does. It, it's a huge time constraint. You go get those planets because you get to them at just the right time. You have to come up with other observations and you know schedule is really they have this you know what's called overhead time time it takes to move the telescope get it in position and then get it on the object and so exoplanets have a huge amount of overhead time where you're not observing anything you're just trying to get it in position to catch that transit at the right time with the data um, and so um, there's lots you know, there's lots of fun things going to this well how how long has the development of the James Webb Telescope from initial thought, hey, we've got to make this to up to this point, then how many years? Oh, at least 30, I would say 30. 
It's, okay. It's at least 30, 30 plus. So maybe put that into perspective. We're trying to understand 30 years of greatest minds on Earth. In well, the, and, and, and the head of PI is 75 years old now. Yeah, we're, he's retired from everything except for, because you might give this up, right? And so we're just trying to understand <laughs> all that. <laughs> yeah, so the head of PI yeah. is now 75 years old, and he's been on this for 30 plus years. It's got to be nothing, because the plan state starts much earlier than that. I mean, originally the launch, ends up here, the original launch date was supposed to be 2007, the $500 million budget. <laughs> So, I, I I I I was involved in um, I was in a meeting with Alistair and New Horizons people. I was doing TVOs back. When I was at the Space Telescope, and I was like, and New Horizons hadn't launched yet. So I'm like, that's going to get report of James Webb does at this stage. And I'm working at Space Telescope, right? So I'm seeing the inside, and I'm like, this is not happening for like 20 more years. And that meeting was like in 2001, 2000, no, 2003, 2004. So yeah, it was about 20 more years. So, if images are expected to come to the sun, what does it mean right now? It's cooling and it's going to be a light in the mirrors. So, that's right now, it just has to cool. So, it has to cool down to the temperature it needs to get to, and then the light in the mirrors has to take place. And then they have to do some, some calibrations. Um, like one of the instruments has these little micro shutters, and they're really cool. So, if you have a field of galaxies you want to look at, you can turn on these micro shutters. So, when you take spectra, it can go like in the x direction or the y direction, and you can only open the shutters where the galaxy is. And close them where there's not a galaxy. And what's really cool about that is when you have galaxies, you don't want their spectra overlapping on your spectrograph. So I've got all these galaxies around. And so let's say I want to look at these two galaxies. Well, if I open up the shutter here and here, I'll get spectra here. But this one's going to get on top of my, my galaxy here. I don't want that to happen. So I don't open that shutter. I keep it closed. So that galaxy is not visible. So, they, so the pillar of galaxy clusters can actually go through, or even star clusters can go through and decide which shutters to open and which shutters to close, and they can take spectra. Well, that cool little shutter mechanism, they're just, at, I mean, if you guys ever played, um, I don't know what to compare it to, like guess who, like the little one. Maybe guess where you, you lift the slab side to see what's underneath the little slot. That's what this is like. You have like these little windows like this. I don't know what to call it, but you have these little shutters, these little micro shutters. Well, during this testing stage, with this instrument, when they were shaking it and baking it, some of those got stuck open and some got stuck closed. So they are no longer operating. So if I galaxy I want to see and that shutter's broken, oh well. Right? So some of them got broken in that process. There's no way they all survived the launch as well. So part of also the calibration was be getting all these things up and running, taking images of those instruments and making sure everything's working properly and what's not working. So a lot of, you know, they'll be taking what we call calibration frames and still looking at standard objects as as they know to make sure that the instruments are reading properly. And once that's all checked out, they'll start going for the science. So you don't want to, you don't want to start going for big science targets until you know for sure you do the easy stuff to make sure everything's working properly. And that has to happen first. first. You know the analogy is there are little pixels and you can operate and control Yeah, you can just kind of open them and close them. Yes, it's totally cool. Uh, so just to get an idea for the size of those micro shutters, what? How, how big is the sensor and how many micro shutters cover the sensor? Oh, good question. I don't know. Are you thinking about using this? Uh, you ever looked at nope. it? Okay. <laughs> so I do brown dwarfs and exoplanets. They're scale, but I don't so they're, okay, they're, they're incredibly small. Um, so I got a minute. I was looking at, I was trying to pull pictures and one of these had a picture of it. Yeah, the micro shutter array. So it was, let's see what we got here. Um, We've got a single shutter is 200 million arc seconds by 450 million arc seconds. I knew it would come in handy. I was looking for other people's talks. Folks have stuff. So there's the size of the shutter right there. Um, and this is what it looks like. Um, but yeah, so they'll be able to, and actually when you're, when, you're, when, you're, when you're getting ready for James Webb, you actually, they know where they're going to point. Um, you have to do all of this in advance and so that they know exactly your galaxy. And I don't do the same thing this, but for the galaxy cluster, they know exactly where the galaxies are located, they know where it's going to point, and they know which shutters have to open which uh, stage shuts. And so they're already planning this. Like, they've already planned it. It's in the program ready to go. So these are little mechanical shutters in the aperture. Yeah, so they just cover the, so the tech is behind those shutters, and you just open and close the ones, the open ones you want open, and the rest stay closed. Which is, like, if you're comparing some of the early photographic plates from like the um, that from Andrew Cannon and the, the Harvard Classification Group, 
And sometimes the spectra of the stars are on top of each other, so you can classify them. This will allow you to not have overlap. You can isolate just the galaxies you want and keep the nearby galaxies that we contaminate shut. Their spectra of their light doesn't come through with their spectrum as well. Wasn't that also the events that they're doing uh, exoplanets that can leave the star blocked out? Yeah, use this issue. Actually, for that, we're more of like a chronograph. Usually, we're going to be chronographing this stuff. Okay. They're chronographing place on those. So, yeah, that's kind of what we're doing. And then, of course, I'm actually more interested in the atmosphere and the transmission spectra. So, I want to see the star. I want this planet to go in front of the star and see the atmosphere. So, I'm like, let's see the atmosphere. That's, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I guess I'm not sure about finding plants or detecting them directly. I want to see the atmosphere. So, that's my whole thing. Any idea what the first targets are? Um, so there's what's called the guaranteed time observations, and those will be the first ones to go. Um, so a lot of these big ones, exoplanets, um, Trappist system. Have you guys heard Trappist? Trappist one. We have seven planets. Trappist one has been given a insanely large amount of telescope time um, in order to try to use the atmospheres of those objects. I would be very surprised if Travis was not one of the first ones to go as soon as they can. But I have not actually looked at this. I don't know if they're doing the schedule yet. Um, but there's some of the big question ones, the exoplanets and the cosmology, focus on the first to go. Because NASA can be cool stuff to put up as soon as possible. And the DTOs um, are immediate release to the public. The science and the data are immediately published and out. Um, whereas some of the GOES can choose to not release their data. So the GOES, a general observer program, they can choose a lot of data for some period of time, they can choose to release it right away. But um, the GTO data, I believe, is immediate release. And NASA will be, and, and, and NASA got a huge team to the GTO. The GTO has produced all of the pipeline reducing the data. They've been playing these problems for quite some time and they've been waiting for the data to launch. So a lot of the software is already in place, ready to go to get that data as soon as they get it. Yeah. Or is that for sure? I think part of what will be the is because it has a very viewing area, it's got to know where the calibration comes in. That's a non determinant. That's true. Three meters, it could be six. But we could say, we're hoping by August, we'll have the data. Yeah. Yeah. So that part of it as well. Yeah. Uh, and then we so it could have a sooner or later. Or later. Yeah. 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 Oh, I think for August for sure we're getting it. I think it could come sooner, but I would say by August, I would say that they can probably plan from August on without any issues, okay. and they might get on sooner. It really just depends on how long it takes to calibrate. Um, yeah, and I actually I enjoy answering questions more than talking. I guess it's eight o'clock. When do you guys end? I'll keep talking, answering questions if you want. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. I mean, I'm glad to keep answering questions. Um, uh, oh, good question. So it has a guaranteed mission lifetime of five years, which means NASA is funding it for five years. Um, with NASA missions, if they're running well, NASA always said that the, the team puts in a request for an extended mission, and I don't think NASA ever does an extended if it's doing good science. There's no way James will not get another five years. So that will be set to 10 years. And then if you saw in the news, it sounded like some of the fuel was not expended that they thought might get expended in getting out to the Lagrange point. Um, and so it might be up to maybe another five years beyond that of fuel still available. But that will be what determines the lifetime of the mission. And Tom's dying here. Go ahead, Tom. You're done. Okay, as I say, he works on Fermi. It's been going for like 20 years. So we launched in 2008. We got a five-year mission. We got extended for five years after that. That got us to 2018. We're still operating. And NASA has a review cycle. It's like this should, this should be building. And unless there's a really good, unless the instrument's really on its last legs, um, they they tend to keep them going. And as long as as long as you look at fuel to stay in the it does take some fuel to stay in the back point. Yeah. As long as it still has fuel to stay there, the instruments are all running. Yeah, they're going to keep going as long as they go. I mean, Hubble was supposed to retire in 20 years. But, but that's it, right? I mean, if it's working well, we don't retire it. I mean, yeah. it's just it becomes part of the budget. Um, so they'll, they'll look into flight tests. Well, so Kepler died, like when the gyros and Kepler went, and that was the end of Kepler. With a Spitzer, it ran out of coolant, and then um, what died eventually, I don't remember. There's something in the The shirt, yeah, something, something else. Maybe they just shut it down, they shut it down. 
but Spitzer is now dead. But they'll, they'll keep it going. Spitzer is not until they extend it more mission to keep working in three to five more months. So, yeah. So it's supposed to look back to the beginning of the universe to the Big Bang. Right. I really, I've always wondered. I mean, well, actually, I thought always, but just now I thought about it. Which direction the sky is at? We're looking at that. It's every direction. So if you think of this expansion of the, I should make him do this actually. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is more of the research, but it, in every direction. So you can think. So we are part of the expansion. If there's there's no there's no center of the universe. Maybe the best way to put this. Every point is part of that expansion. And so as this expansion expands into space, everywhere you look in space. Um, you're looking back in time, whether it's up, down, left, right, whatever. You're looking back in time through that space. So I'm going to see um, the, the cosmic microwave background radiation, which was produced at the time of recombination, coming from that location and this location. So you look like a picture of a, like, a double map, double map or plank of the, that microwave background radiation, right? It's basically uniform in all directions um, because there is no center. There is no, it, it's all, right. you're, you're just, Maybe like concentric circles of time, right? So we're seeing from the middle of our current time as we look out farther and farther away, we're looking at a different time and space. And so everywhere around us, we're getting that CMB radiation. Um, and one thing that this is going to try to look at is during the time of recombination, the Earth's cooled cold enough where the, the hydrogen and helium that was ionized could then capture the free electrons and create atoms. We call that recombination. At that point, Photons in the early are able, able to then travel freely through space. And at that point, they were decoupled from the matter. And so as the radiation decoupled from the matter, they now travel freely through space. They evolved and, and were redshifted over time to their current temperature of like 3 Kelvin. And then, of course, within the matter of the universe, high-density areas collapsed to form the first stars and galaxies, and low-density areas became the voids. Um, and so the matter has evolved separately from that radiation that's traveling through space. And every minute, a new photon hits you, you can be a little bit farther and farther and farther away in space. Um, so that photon has now reached you from that point in space a little bit farther away. Does that make sense? So it's going to look, it's not, it's look like, so at the other combination, it's going to be what's called a reionization. When all these really hot stars are formed, they also come to light these hydrogen flame stars, and you're then blasting the universe with this high energy of the photon, start ionizing the gas again. It's all the kind of reionization as well. Um, they're going to I don't know enough about JMSO's capability to know if it's going to try to say that organization, that it's going to try to look back to that time period. They will not see the first stars. It will see the first stars. And maybe it's going to the first stars that gets lucky. Relative to uh, that explanation, how far back is Hubble able to see and how much farther has James Webb expected to see? Uh, so Hubble can see, so, so considering we're like 13.8 billion. So let's let, let see what is a bit like, like galaxies. So Hubble has galaxies back to 11 billion light years. I think, I mean, not this, I mean, might be something, maybe 13 billion? I don't know. James Webb? Yeah, the first stars were just a few hundred million years after million the Big Bang, so probably back to about 13 billion well, years. We're not going to get to the 13.8. Yeah, so I'm not going to get to those first stars, but about 13 billion things are based on fraps. And the loss of that happens. The early universe was, that early time after recombination, was quite cloudy and opaque. And so yeah. when there weren't any stars and it was cloudy, it's kind of, well, I don't know, right? When it's cloudy and there's no stars, <laughs> not much to see. So you want to see those first stars and first galaxies poking out of the clouds. We're, we're thinking along the electromagnetic spectrum, and it's, it's not the visible spectrum. We're looking at the wavelength here. Yes, so the mass part, so the redshift, right? So I guess I should say to you why James Webb is operating from 1 to 30 microns, basically, is because we're looking for extreme redshift. And so these galaxies have been, and you know, and I don't think it's done like robot quasars before, right? But we're looking at things that are very high redshift. They're, they're, the spectrum, the light has shifted very far into the infrared. Um, so this picture right here is kind of showing you um, that cloudy time. That cloudy time. <laughs> yeah. So um, so here's that cloudy time. Here's that recombination. We can't see back into it, and we call this the cosmic dark ages because you don't have any stars or galaxies. You just have the matter that's getting collected and everything in high density regions. Um, but there's nothing that emits light in this period of time right here. Um, and then the first stars and the first galaxies. 
Um, so it looks like um, looks like they're saying maybe 13.4, if that's what that's supposed to mean. Um, but James will be able to do this kind of realization when um, these stars and galaxies are making all this um, kind of field for the photons and they're ionizing the gas, not the microphone back on the hydrogen gas. And so that's the kind of realization right there. And so you've got Hubble right here. So I said 11 billion years. Well, that's my speed 11 on that scale. So roughly 11 billion years or so for Hubble, and hopefully, like I said, about 13 billion for James Webb. Will there be any benefit to a little bit of parallax in the orbit for any of the research that Webb is doing? I think for distances or? Yeah. Well, Guy will take care of all of that. Maybe yeah. for the uh, stuff that's in the Milky Way. Exoplanets, maybe. I don't, I don't. It's only like 1% farther so. than the Earth, so it's not really any different than and Gaia. And if you could, I think Gaia would do a better job, anyways. Yeah. That's what Gaia was built for. So I, th I think anything that James Webb could do, Gaia's going to do, anyways. Here's what Gaia is looking at. It's supposed to be in parallaxes. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer more questions. I actually prefer this anyways than talking. Um, I guess I do like to put numbers up. I like to impress people. I just I love the amount of work like 1,200 scientists in issues that years from 14 countries over 25 years. I just think that's so amazing that that many people in that many countries can come together and take together a mission like this. Um, even if it costs us $10 billion. Um, um, and then, um, yeah, and then we keep it cold. Oh, and then each mirror, if you want to know why the alignment is so important, it's got to be aligned to one ten thousandth of the thickness of a human hair. And that's what's taking so long. It's getting all of that done. Um, to compare mirror sizes, um, you guys probably already know this, but um, the relative light gathering power of James Webb has an effective area of 25 meters squared. Hubble is like 4.5 meters squared, and Spitzer is 0.6 meters squared. That light gathering power and that infrared is going to allow James Webb to go very far back in time that you just couldn't do with Hubble. You just, I mean, think if, I think, I would not be surprised if James Webb does a deep field. I'd be shocked if they didn't do a deep field of some kind at some point and just stared and saw how much farther they can see than Hubble can see. So I'd be really surprised if that's not on the plan at some point. Um, anyways, um, do you have more questions? Yeah. So there, of all the cameras that have passed, there are none that do this whole life. There are none. So this is that this is not a whole replacement. There is nothing that will do. So that's a big concern by the astronomers. The little bit of UV they have is now gone. When Hubble goes, that goes. It also means they get higher priority on the whole space those proposals. But because a lot of the friend of James Webb is going up, right? If you know James Webb, I mean if you know the Hubble should be Hubble, but a lot of that science with that Hubble's doing will be shifted to James Webb at this point. The high rate of galaxy, the transiting planets, all that will move. Well we have now Earth-based telescopes in process of being built and already developed and mm -hmm. operating that are almost mm -hmm. equal to when Hubble first began. Yeah. So You've got visible cover. You know, that covers. Yeah, check through the depth of can get better resolution than Hubble can. Okay, so, yeah, or it's incredible to ACS, to make ACS. But yeah, so yeah, we don't really need it. It's the ultraviolet that hurts the most. Because that doesn't, we can get a small part of the ultraviolet band, so the rest is won't be able So it's the UV astronomers that are hurting the most. One of the reasons that small bit of Hubble, what like, costs, um, the cause of origins explore mission range was with the ultraviolet. That hurts a little bit. When Hubble goes down, they're going to hurt. But it'll be cool. I, I think for all of us, we're just so glad that it's operating. Um, and then, of course, some of the science we can do. Um, for me, personally, my infrared, this is kind of a cool picture of um, the Eagle Nebula and optical. And then in the IR. And so star formation and the formation of planets and being able to probe into these dark regions um, at those 
near mid and far infrared wavelengths. We can actually, the dust will glow at longer wavelengths. We can study the dust. We can study the young stellar objects that are embedded. We can see protoplanetary disks. Um, this is going to be huge for star formation. And so, we already talked about that. Um, and so, I'm just going to bring up um, kind of some of the science goals. Um, um, the birth of stars and protoplanetary systems. Um, James Webb will do, I think, more to kind of break this area open than we have in the past. Because right now we have to fly on Sophia. Do you guys know what Sophia is? So it's a, yeah, it's a telescope on the back of an airplane that goes about four hours, four to six hour, you know, legs at a time. Um, and it's it's up above, it's up in the stratosphere, so you're up above most of the water, and then you can actually image in the minute for about the Earth's atmosphere blocking it. Um, and that's really all we have going right now, and it's not super sensitive to faint objects. They do a lot of study of star formation regions and the gases and things, but James is going to blow that out of the water. Uh, they'll be able to do science-wise now, so that's kind of exciting for them. Um, and then, of course, I'm interested in time period systems and atmospheres and life, the structure of galaxies, um, and how galaxies come and cluster together is going to be really important, and then, of course, the first light from the first stars in the ionization time period. And those are kind of four big science areas that James Upson may hit. Uh, I'm sorry to keep asking so many questions, but this, this will be tricky. As an astronomer, uh, obviously this is of great interest to me, but if I could take the role of adversary, I'm on a congressional committee and I'm saying, gee, you just spent $10 billion or something, sure it cost $500 million. What's the bottom line? Uh, benefit to humanity here. I mean, what are we going to get out of this? Yeah, science is science is safe, right? We're going to be able to, well, yeah. This is the, the search for knowledge. Know that the same question I was asking at the, uh, the original, at the beginning of the space race. What are we going to get out of this? Yeah, and, and, and NASA's pretty right. Mm -hmm. But NASA in its statement mm -hmm. has something about, you know, to, to learn to knowledge, gain knowledge to get out there, to learn to get more before. Um, technology always benefits us too, right? I might have that while I mentioned, right? All the technology that we James Webb spills over the industry. Yes. In, in key ways. Um, so that's always true too. And also happens. Yeah. Yeah, but also. So with 14 countries that are part of this project, is the, is the telescope completely booked out for its receivable? No. So how it works is, I'll ask you a question. I have a slide about the how this work system works. Um, so the guaranteed time observations, oh, there it is. So the guaranteed time observations, those were, were proposed for several years ago. And these are like, these are the things of what science questions can we not skip, right? What do we, in five years, what absolutely has to happen? What do we absolutely have to do? So several astronomy team put together their proposals, and um, those then went to NASA, and then astronomers went through those proposals that were not included with those proposals, right? So it's completely, like, so when you're sitting on an, an allocation committee, you, you can't have any affiliation or any connection to any of the people that are proposing. They go through, they make the science, but what, what do we really need to get? You only have so many hours we can give. So the guaranteed time observations, these two proposals, we're given 4,020 hours over the first 30 months. And that's going to be, you know, science which cannot possibly not get out of this telescope. Um, but um, there's what's called the Guest Observer Program. And this, so we have each cycle, right? So cycle one is already accepted and approved. Cycles two, three, four, and five are coming. So what's Joshua's last name? Walkinger. Walkinger. So you have a new scientist or interview that's on, has a James Webb proposal that's accepted. Um, so it's part of one of these GO care type, here, I'm assuming it's GO. I don't think so. Yeah. So yeah, I'm going to look it up. Because um, one of my co is a co on that one. So I'm going to look it up. So um, it's a geo program. Um, and so each site that they call for open access to the community. And it's 70% basically of the time that's still available. So they only filled up, they filled up some of the first three years with this data. And they filled the first year with the first cycle of geos. But then cycle two does not have the call yet because of all the delays of COVID. So, um, and, and they didn't have to delay cycle one any more than they already had, so I was just have this happen, let's get these in, and we have them ready to go. So, so year one is filled, but year two, three, four, and five, same percent is not filled. 
and that will come. And so every year, I mean, anyone can have anyone can pull us for time. So you kind of have to be, I mean, you don't have to be at a, a, a research place if it helps with connections. That amateur group on things are kind of worse. So, um, do you have any proposals? I do not have any. But I am with other people on other things. Mine were rejected as well. So I, 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 I was a little afraid after that my class for too many hours, and I was I probably did. That was one of the things like, uh, this isn't high enough science justification for them with our jobs. You have to realize that for every proposal that gets accepted, there were probably not even that rejected. So a couple of right now is a one in nine rejection rate of the Non stop, yes. <laughs> I just, my subscriber sent me a grant today, right? And it's off, and I'm like, I'll we'll see. I want to six, one in seven chance you get it. But yeah, it's, but you know, it, but as the science comes down, um, the cool thing is all the data reduction is in place because we've been waiting so long. It's all running through Python, basically, so you can actually, if you, uh, if you have a mixed system or Mac or an Anaconda environment, you can basically download the games web, Python, your reduction, they have all this online. You don't have to use it. Anybody who wants to go browse the data and work with it. What would we Google if we wanted to see all the data? Oh. Question, question. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Can you start the field? Uh, let's see. JWST. Um, Webinars, J webinars. The Hubble Space Telescope proposals are due next month, and this is the cycle 30. It's the 30th year that we've accepted proposals. James will not go that long. <laughs> For the Hubble. Yeah. The first time um, in cycle seven. But it's the, um, so these are called J webinars. These are the videos they have for reducing the data. I start with video number one. Um, but um, they basically have all the data written up in Python. Most part it's running in it's running in the Anaconda environment with uh, Python 3 and um, um, the reduction tools and so um, and Jupyter notebooks they use that called webinars um, so I've been going through these because I'm trying to be ready to come August when the data comes down so I don't think it's really lost in the notes but they have they have the basic introduction webinar they have their instruments imaging the cost of the tool I think that got webinar 15 now. So they're slowly releasing this over time. Let me uh, ask you to stretch your imagination a little. And would you perhaps project for us just a picture of, okay, the first views that the web telescope is going to produce in August, what's it going to look like, and what can we expect to see? I mean, it shows up on the uh, uh, national news. The first images of the James Webb Telescope are really besides a bunch of graphs. I would not be surprised if they the planet, Jupiter or Saturn. I think they would if that's the QGPR, depending on Jupiter or Saturn and its moons. Um, what? They're close to the sun right now. <laughs> Can you get it? Well, they are right now, but they won't be in the summer. Yeah, that's true. They're high in the sun in the summer. It's not summer. I would be very surprised if we didn't see a planet come down. A galaxy, a galaxy, um, emerging galaxy. I think one of the big stars that I could probably do, that's just me. But some cool galaxy mergers, um, galaxy clusters. Um, I the probably see something take a long time to like this, but it will come a bit faster. Just from the cycles that the year people might not have that project. So a lot of the things we see in the infrared are not nearly as exciting as they look in the optical. Oh, but Jupiter is. So <laughs> I suspect that they will pick targets that have really beautiful optical images from the Hubble or something else and then kind of use it in a comparative way. But Jupiter is gorgeous in the IR. That's true. Jupiter is, yeah, that's true. why I like looking over Jupiter. It's just beautiful. Um, you can see you can see the holes in the clouds. You see the deep radiation coming out. I'm a cloud person, so it's just really gorgeous. Um, and I think I think those should be fields fairly early on, so they can compare and contrast what Hubble did with what James Webb can do, and and uh, how many more galaxies they'll get in that area, that field of view. 
So that's my projection. I think we'll see a Jupiter. I'd be really surprised if we don't see a Jupiter. And I think we're going to see a deep field and then cool <coughs> galaxies. Think about galaxy mergers. Because when two galaxies collide and you have all that dust there in the middle, you have star formation taking place. And then the IR of those galaxies are amazing. And so you have their, 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 their ultra luminous in the infrared. And so they should be pretty cool pictures of these galaxy mergers. Because all the star formation and the dust is being heated by the sun. Targets, one that's close enough and that would be spectacular. Um, maybe Beagle. I think mean, might like one might take like well Hubble pictures, like you said, and the the nearby Hubble pictures, and then take pictures near the way. So maybe Beagle star. Is this going to allow us to see? more center of our own galaxy. Yeah, actually, if for as all as point for yeah. So um so yeah you 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 yeah you can see more of the center of the galaxy. I'm sure there are plans to look at the black hole in the center and the start moving around it. It's not really my area, so I'm guessing but I I know more about the GTOs that you guys have been that stuff. Yeah. How does it feel to view the different instruments compare to all so I know for Hubble, some oh. of the popular objects were considered comfortable at the time. Yeah, so yeah, let me grab the PowerPoint slide. I think, let me talk. Let's see, did I? To the infrared camera, they're very comfortable, but the resolution is much sharper and much many, better. many, many more pixels. Yeah, it's just going to be amazing. I thought it was about two pixels for resolution or something. It's one of those slides. Yeah. Um and then we have to mosaic. So when you're putting a proposal for something, so they actually um like a Jane, the, the, the software is really kind of cool because if you, if you take the instrument, you have to really use the instrument, you can download a picture of the gaps you want to look at, and so it's large in your field of view. You actually build the mosaic as part of the, of the, of the system. So like a real full galaxy, right? If I want to get that extra little piece there, I might need seven, I might be able to get, I might get the main galaxy right in like six um, um, images, and maybe just seventh or eighth to get all of it. And you can literally change the orientation to try to minimize as, many, as much data as you need so that it just lines just perfectly on top of it. Because they use that as a training, I wonder, I don't know, but, um, This may not happen, but you never know with Google. Probably not, because it's going to go Whirlpool Galaxy images instead. Whirlpool would be, okay, granted, they're using the Whirlpool as an example for the mosaicing. It might be in the thing. But like you like, in that little extra piece there, right there, that little galaxy. So um, it takes about six, um, so on your camp, it takes about six fields of view to six to nine to get this part right here. And then you have to get this part right here as well. So uh, you can you can orient it just right to get the, the cameras are not uh, perfectly square. Um, and so you can orient them just right to uh, pick that up at the Whirlpool Galaxy. Um, I bet Whirlpool's on the first images because they are using it for their mosaic example in their books. They've already created a plan for how to mosaic and get image out of it. So I bet that's one of them. Like when you go do the tutorials to figure out how to write your proposal, that one's in there. So, anyways, but I've there's probably no way to find. What? I see the telescope right there. Yeah. We just scroll down a little bit. I don't know how. I mean, I'm just I'm just trying. Oh, the James Webb Space Telescope. Yeah. yeah. But this is just. I probably have to go into the tutorials to pull up the images. Yeah. To actually see them. Although. Been pre COVID. Um, um, this may or may not be on this computer. So I get to see all the cool folders I have to get rid of. Just here the puzzles. I 
I need to have a seat, but I don't. Okay. Um, any other questions? You willing to come back next year and yeah, actually, I was saying I'm going. I'm going on sabbatical. I'm leaving for six months to go down to University of Arizona to basically focus for six months on James Webb and our models and our atmosphere models. So I'd be happy to come back a year from now. Perfect. With hopefully with James Webb data reduced and by the atmosphere models that we're doing for the brown dwarfs, um, and, you know, exoplanets, and see what we got with James Webb. Yeah. Yeah, because the guy I'm working with, he's on. He's on a. Joshua's proposal. It's like on nine different H James Webb proposals. So, wow. um, so he's like, I could use some help. And I'm like, I would love to come help. So, so, okay. so there, I, I think we're basically guaranteed those proposals. We'll have data by the end of December. Wonderful. Should be fun. Yeah. So yeah. I think I just ended there. I don't know. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you so much.